Hey, Forcey Divers! Welcome to Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in. We want to know if you're listening in from which location. Are you here in South Florida? Are you in the state of Florida? Are you outside of Florida? Are you in the country, out of the country? Go ahead and say hello to us in the comments section and go ahead and tell us where you're listening in from. Uh, we've got Jesse over here. Jesse's saying hello to everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> All right. So we have a lot of great things planned for you guys. As always, great presentation for tonight. So let's get rolling here. Um, you guys know the drill. If you like the presentation, give us a thumbs up, smiley face, or a heart emoji and let us know that you are enjoying tonight. Uh, also, if you have not done... sure you go to www.force-e.com before 645 because after that the registration closes and I'm going to pull everyone's name from the registration and do that name picker and we're going to be giving away a da -da 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 -da, intro to tech diving e-learning digital kit slash code so uh, you're going to be learning a little bit more about what that is and and what that all means if you don't know what it is um, so if you are interested in learning about tech, this is the first step, and you can possibly win that digital code to get you started. And obviously, we are in our tech month here at 4C. October, we like to theme tech month, so we've already had some great presentations about DUI dry suits and how to rig your technical backplate and wing. So if you missed those presentations, go to our YouTube channel and check those out if you're interested. And also this one will be posted to the YouTube channel as well once we finish. So, all right, look, Jesse, everyone's saying hello. Here they are. Hello, Woo! hello, everybody. Awesome. All right, and before we roll out, like I said, guys, it is Tech Month here at 4C and we have lots of things that you can get involved with. If you're not a tech diver yet, you can take courses with any of our 4C instructors that, tech, that teach these courses. Um, and we also have technical dive trips. We have some of the best tech diving in the area down here in South Florida. We've got beautiful wrecks that are in great depths where you can learn and discover and have a lot of fun. And if you want to go and do that, you got to take a class. And if you've already been certified to do them, we'll get you out there. We'll get you diving. So if you're not in this area, Make sure to give us a call and we'll plan some tech diving trips for you. And then we can fill them up and go diving. All right. So uh, we are going to go ahead and start the presentation. Jesse, go ahead. We're going to journey into the world of technical diving with TDI. All right. Sounds great to me. Thank you very much. Awesome. So I'll go ahead and give a basic introduction to myself and what we're going to do today. Thank you all for having me and joining we are going to be talking about journeying into the world of technical diving. Now, my name is Jesse Iacono, and I work for International Training. And International Training is the parent company of five distinct agencies um, involving diving and first aid. So we have SDI, which is Scuba Diving International, TDI, Technical Diving International, uh, ERDI, Emergency Response Diving International, PFI, Performance Free Diving International, and we also have First Response Training International, which handles more of the first aid and CPR stuff. Now, I am the territory manager for North America here, so my job is to make sure that all of our divers and facilities and members are happy in the US, Canada, and Caribbean. So if anybody ever wants to contact, talk more about these topics or the agencies in general, you can always find my contact information on the website here. Now, we're going to be speaking about some TDI concepts here uh, in particular in technical diving. Now TDI is the largest and most innovative technical diving in, uh, agency in the world and it was our first agency. So all of the other ones that exist here, SDI, ERDI, were all born of technical diving and technical diving concepts. So I am a um, instructor trainer evaluator as well as a technical instructor and an avid diver on many levels. So my goal here today is to guide you all through the basics of technical diving, what it is, some of the um, basic concepts of what structures technical diving and how you yourself can get into it. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started.
So let's start with the basics. What is technical diving? Now, it is more than just serious looking people wearing all black and complicated equipment on the dive boats. It is a way of life, an advanced form of diving that brings a lot of joy and challenge to many people's diving careers. And when we take a look at diving, there are basically three main types that it breaks down to. There's recreational, which is diving done for fun. There is commercial diving, which is diving done for vocation. And then there's also scientific diving, which is where we're diving for research. Now, sport and technical diving both fall into the recreational diving world because we do them for enjoyment. And when we look at technical diving, what we're doing here is we're extending outside of the normal range of sport diving. And sport diving is what most of us signed in here are probably doing these days, going to the basic dive site, jumping off the boat, doing some elementary dive planning, and then seeing some pretty fish and reminiscing on the awesome experience we have at the end of it. However, when we get into technical diving, we are extending those limits that we normally use in sport diving. So we may be familiar with the 130 foot depth limit or following the no decompression limits on our computers. And when we get into technical diving, we stay longer or we dive deeper or we go into different environments with um, overhead and things like that. So when we look at those fundamental concepts and break it down to that physics and physiology a little review here of what we start in our sport diving courses, we know that as we go down and we do our diving, we take on a certain amount of nitrogen, our bodies can't do much with that nitrogen, and we have to off-gas that by the time we get to the surface. Now, with sport diving, we do dives where we can make an ascent directly to the surface, where we'll usually do a safety stop as a precautionary measure, and we'll be able to off-gas all of that nitrogen. With technical diving, we typically stay deeper or longer and that way, on our way up, we have mandatory stops. So it's like a safety stop, but at certain depths and times, you know, scheduled options, where we would release that extra nitrogen that's in our system and make sure that it's out to a reasonable level before we make it to the surface. And that's, that's the basic fundamental idea of technical diving. Now, technical diving involves mixed gases, extending your limits. It also has overhead environments. And we talk about overhead environments, we may mean theoretical, such as a ceiling made by a decompression obligation, or physical, such as a wreck or a cave. And then we also have a lot of precision and planning in technical diving. Now, here we have a basic overview of the technical diving courses that TDI offers. And as you can see, it's a flow chart that shows a progression of courses on the open circuit side, rebreather, and overhead. And we can go through those briefly here just so we have a basic understanding of what these terms mean and how that tree works of, of progression as we look at tech diving in general and uh, determine if and what we may want to do with it. Now, looking at it, let's start with open circuit. Open circuit diving is where you're breathing compressed gas from a cylinder, and then once you release that gas, you, you exhale it, it goes into the environment, and you're done with it. Whereas rebreathers, closed circuit diving, you have a closed loop where you're rebreathing the same gas, but it's uh, inserting additional oxygen and scrubbing it of CO2. Now, with open circuit, we start with our basic nitrox level. And that is using oxygen mixtures up to 40% oxygen. It helps us reduce the nitrogen in that mixture, allowing us longer no decompression limits at the uh, depths we were diving to already, as well as shorter surface intervals. When we move through that tree, you'll see the next one are the next ones are side mount and intro to tech. Now, side mount and intro to tech are typically gear based and they show us how to behave like a tech diver. So intro to tech, for example, teaches you how to use double cylinders worn on your back, as well as how to get more involved with tech diving concepts, how to dive like a tech diver, how to do gas management and advanced dive planning, things like that. And side mount is similar, but it involves your cylinders on your sides instead of your back, just like the person in the picture in the background of this flow chart. From there, you would move into advanced nitrox, which is typically paired with decompression procedures, where you learn how to use 
um, elevated mixtures of nitrox with, with higher levels of oxygen in them. So all the way up to 100% oxygen. And that helps us accelerate those decompression stops that, that might become mandatory on the tech dives that we're doing. And then decompression procedures shows you the techniques on how to do those stops, how to be a tech diver and dive up to a depth of 150 feet. From there, you have helitrox, which is the same depth limit, but involves some helium in your mix. Also, we have extended range and trimix, which are the next level from there and involve extending your, uh, your depth to either 180 or 200 feet of depth. With the trimix course, it does use helium and that helps limit both the percentages of oxygen and nitrogen in your gas mixture. So that way we can limit narcosis and achieve deeper depths. And then finally, you have advanced trimix, which also is involving helium carrying more cylinders and diving down to depths of maximum of 330 feet. And that's typically the max you'll see with certification agencies that they'll certify up to. People doing dives past that are usually going um, by their own devices to do so. Now, as we look on the other end of this tree and we look at rebreather, this is where you have that specialized piece of equipment, a closed circuit rebreather which is allowing you to cycle this, the, the same gas over and over. It helps strip the, the CO2 out of that as well as add oxygen to that. And you'd start at the air diluent CCR level. As you work up through air diluent deco, helitrox, mixed gas, it's similar to the open circuit levels where it extends your range on how deep you can go and what gas mixtures you can use for those types. And then finally, we have the overhead section over to the bottom right, which involves cavern, intro to cave and full cave, which would be our cave progression of courses, allowing you to get into overhead environments like that, as well as advanced rec. And those are typically your three main disciplines you'll see in tech diving. Now you'll also notice there's some service courses in there, which would be allowing us to blend our own gases. There's things like diver propulsion vehicles, scooters, cave survey, stave cage, stage cave, sorry, as well as the professional levels. So as you can see, there's certainly a lot of directions to go with technical diving based on what your goals are and where you want to take it, how far you want to go, what it is that you want to see. And we'll discuss some more of that here in just a bit. Now, here's one of the big questions we ask is why tech dive, right? We see that we know what it involves, extending that range, using various different pieces of equipment along the way, getting deeper, spending longer times there. But when it comes to why we tech dive, there's lots of reasons. And we say, choose your adventure. You can choose which direction that you want to take it. If you are more into equipment and you really like the techie side of things, and you really want to extend the time you can spend, maybe you're gonna go down the rebreather route. If you want to stay with open circuit and extend your depth and times, be able to see uh, more things, gain access to more dive sites or spend more time at the ones you're already at, those are great reasons too. We also have those who are interested in diving things like caves, we talked about that. Overhead diving is a very interesting one. Uh, we have uh, cave country here up in North Florida and also in other close by areas like Mexico, uh, where this picture is from here. And there's a lot of exciting things about those types of environments. Some people are also interested in doing wreck diving, like this picture here that was taken in, um, in the Keys diving on the Duane. So for each one of us, there's a certain aspect of diving that's going to excite us. And tech diving is an awesome tool on how we can achieve different levels of that same diving we're doing. So maybe I want to get to that deeper wreck that's a little bit outside of my range and it's at 140 or 150 feet. Maybe I want to explore some new underwater environments and check out the caves. Maybe I just want to spend a ton of time on that reef that I love so much. It gives me the tools and expertise to do those types of things that I want to be able to do. And each one of us, like I said, is going to choose our own adventure and have a reason that we're going to do that. Also, some people will like the new equipment aspect of it. You can get involved in all kinds of different equipment. Uh, which we'll have a, another section here in just a little bit talking about. Maybe we're using it for research purposes, search and recovery if we're doing um, public safety work or getting involved with salvage. Or some people are using it for their professions and working at depth, right? It may be useful for some of those other modes of diving we talked about earlier, like the research aspect or the, the commercial side. And how can we use technical diving? 
So we know our why, we know what it is. What are some of the ways that it's going to benefit us beyond the obvious making it to new places that we haven't seen before, right? It's important to have those reasons on why we want to go tech diving because with these increased abilities does come increased risk. So it's always good to have that goal of what you're going to shoot for, what you're going to try to get to. Now, one of the main things, like we've said a few times here, is extending your range, being able to spend more time on the reefs and wrecks that you love, being able to have access to the dive sites that are deeper than your current certification level. Improving your skills and awareness is another one. You'll be able to hone in on your form in the water, how you use your equipment, the awareness that you have towards your dive buddy, the dive site, the dive planning that you use to go doing those dives. So there's tons and tons of advantages on those levels. Some people love exploring new equipment, getting into back plates and wings. I know there's been another session just on that um, in this Facebook Live series. Also getting into things like rebreathers, diver propulsion vehicles, all of that is a ton of fun. And then finding new environments. Some people want to explore the different types of environments. And you'll notice I'm focusing a lot of this presentation here on South Florida or Florida in general, but apply this to anywhere. If you want to go do the Great Lakes and check out the awesome shipwrecks there or fly halfway across the world to check something out in those areas. And then also there's a ton of benefit to sport level dives. Now, when I'm doing tech dives, my favorites are typically in the 120 to 160 foot range. I really like the, the balance there of how much time I can spend at depth versus how much time I'm spending on those decompression stops on the way to the surface. But I find that as a tech diver, it brings a lot more confidence and knowledge even to the basic sport dives that you might be doing every weekend at 60 foot reefs. It helps you understand the concepts of what's going on in your body and with the physics behind diving. It helps you understand more about those numbers on your computer and understand how that no decompression limit is calculated, what it means, and what actually happens if you go beyond it. And having the confidence to get yourself out of situations if you do something like accidentally go beyond a no decompression limit or decide that you need to stay in a certain area for longer than intended and knowing the dive planning that goes behind that, as well as the gas management, which is extremely important in this type of diving. Now let's talk about some gear differences as well. This is perhaps one of the most apparent and exciting differences between technical diving and sport diving. As you can see here in this slide, we have a diver with a rebreather system on. It's very cool looking, but also a, a complicated and exciting piece of equipment that can be used. Now, as tech divers, we love our equipment. And we have a saying, two is one and one is none. So one of the first things you'll notice about tech divers is that they're usually carrying more equipment than the average sport diver. However, every item that we use in tech diving does have a purpose. And that two is one and one is none saying comes from the idea that if we're on a dive and we have mandatory decompression stops or a hard overhead environment, we need to be able to work our way through situations if some of that equipment fails. So we have a lot more responsibility to ourselves and our buddies to make sure that that equipment is in working order, to make sure we have enough of it, it's working properly, and it's intended for the dives we're doing, and we have backups just in case anything negative were to happen. So as we look at tech divers, we can see lots of gear differences. Here is uh, an image here that's showing divers doing the same dive. One's diving on back mount double cylinders, you can see on the left, and then one is using side mount cylinders on the right. They're going to have several equipment differences, but still be able to accomplish the same diving task. So when we look at differences in tech diving equipment, one of the most apparent ones we see is the difference in cylinders. Typically, you'll have most tech divers using a minimum of two cylinders mounted either on their back or on their sides. And then they also may have additional decompression cylinders, travel gases, different valves on those cylinders. Um, they'll have some for redundancy, all kinds of things like that that are going to help them accomplish the tasks that they want. And the more involved or the deeper the dive may involve more and more cylinders to accomplish those dives. Now the next one we find are regulators. Often divers of, or doing tech dives are going to have more regulators. Those regulators are going to be higher performance. They'll have different hose lengths. You might see common lengths of a shorter hose, maybe 22 inches. That's 
going right under the diver's chin, and then another one that's five to seven feet wrapping around them and coming out um, in front of them. They'll be the main regulator they use in their mouth. And they're going to be more regulators. So you'll have two for your primary cylinders, one for your decompression cylinder, and then one or two for every single cylinder you have from there. The next ones are buoyancy compensation devices. So one of the key differences, especially on the back mount option, is you'll notice that most tech divers are using a backplate harness and wing setup. And with those, um, you're going to have a much more tailored fit and something that's modular. So a diver can fit the harness directly to them using a backplate that may be lighter or heavier, depending on the nature of what they need it for. And then they can link their single cylinder up to it or their double cylinders using different wings with different lift capacities or even their rebreather down the line to be able to accomplish those tasks. Whereas a side mount diver is typically going to wear those cylinders on the side and they'll have, as you can see here in this picture, a different type of BCD that is specifically tailored to using side mount cylinders where the air cell is going to be on their back and it's going to be rigged to put the cylinders on the sides. Now also tech divers are going to use more advanced computers. They'll be more capable. They'll usually have two of those for that redundancy factor. Their basics, their masks and fins are typically going to be a little more advanced. We all seem to love the color black but also fins that are geared more towards maneuverability and propulsion to push all that heavy equipment on divers. And then their exposure protection is going to typically advance as well. So around here in South Florida, we can get away with using wetsuits on a lot of our dives, but on some of those dives, the longer ones, the deeper, or as we get into more chillier environments, a lot of tech divers opt for dry suits as well because it allows them to stay warm throughout the entirety of the dive. And then we get into specialized equipment, things like rebreathers, which are exciting pieces of equipment that can really extend the range of divers. They can take a diver and have a scrubber time of maybe four to six hours on their back instead of their cylinders that might only last um, one to two hours at a certain depth, or maybe even less, and also help reduce some of their decompression obligations. Also diver propulsion vehicles, which are uh, scooters that can propel people around. And you'll notice lots of accessories, reels, lights, cutting devices, surface marker buoys, lift bags, bolt snaps, lots of specialized things as well. Tech divers love that equipment and it helps get them through whatever task it is, whatever objective they have for those dives. And what you'll notice is that most tech divers also use the concept of streamlining, which is where we reduce drag and clutter, bringing only what we need on the dives that we're doing. Um, it allows us to have less entanglement hazards as well as easier accessibility to that equipment that is so important to the dives that we're doing. And here you can see three tech divers using different modes of diving that are very much geared up. So you have a diver using double cylinders with uh, a couple de decompression travel cylinders on them. You also have two rebreather dives, divers diving in a mixed team here with multiple cylinders on them. So often advanced tech divers will look like this and have all kinds of cylinders, all kinds of equipment. And like we said, every single one of those has its own purpose. Now, I do see a good question coming in, um, and we will have opportunities for more questions at the end, but I'll specifically answer this one in this section, and that's the question of when to use back mount versus side mount. And one of the most common ways that we look at back mount versus side mount diving is in caves, because side mount diving lowers that vertical profile of a diver, and it allows them to fit in tighter spaces. They can also, remove or manipulate cylinders in front of them to help them uh, fit through smaller spaces. Now that being said, every diver has their own reason for using their own equipment. So you may see side mount divers diving on wrecks and off of boats. You may also have back mount divers diving in caves. So a lot of this comes down to personal preference, but people may choose back mount because it's easier to get on and off of a boat and fit through the, the doorways in a wreck versus people that are choosing side mount in a cave because they can squeeze through those tighter spaces and they don't have to turn sideways going through doorways and things like that. So 
there's lots of opportunity there. And as you learn more about technical diving, as you take more of these courses, you're going to be exposed to more of this information and how you can accomplish each one of those tasks. And one of the most important things about being a technical diver is understanding why you're choosing to do the things that you're doing and choose the equipment that you're wearing, knowing exactly the reason that you chose that and the purpose that it's going to fulfill. One of the other things that differs with tech divers is their technical diving mindset. As we move through this training, it trains us to be more and more cognizant of those little details on our dives and how they're going to affect us. Now, dive planning is one of the biggest difference between sport and technical diving. With sport diving, we take more of a casual approach. We come up with some basics, maybe the maximum depth we're going to go to, staying within our no decompression limits, how long we're going to spend, how much gas we're going to have at the end of the dive. We go, we have some fun, and we come up towards the end. With technical diving, we plan out everything. So as a technical diver, you're going to learn how to calculate the amount of gas you use at every stage during your dive, when to use different gas mixtures, where you and your buddy are going to be at different times throughout the dives, what your objectives are, how you're going to accomplish those, who's going to shoot the surface marker buoy to the surface, who's going to lead the team. And all of that is on a strict schedule that you follow to make sure that you stay within your plan and have enough gas for the whole team to accomplish each one of those goals that you had for the dive. And that way you don't end up short on gas or out of gas at any point and we get to the surface with a nice reserve. So that way us and our team members are always making it home and moving on to our next technical dive that we can start planning and get involved in. Awareness is also a big factor of technical divers. We like to make sure that we're always aware of where our buddies are because it's our responsibility to take care of them as well. And if anything happens, they have some of that reserve gas that might bail us out of a hard situation. Also, we wanna be aware of the environment we're in because we don't wanna get stuck in narrow spaces, tangled in fishing line, or in any other sort of negative situation that could extend the time that we were supposed to be at the bottom or put us in a hard situation that compromises our gas or our safety in any way. We also have objectives for the diving that we're doing. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to know why you want to tech dive and have ideas of what you're trying to reach, not just for the sake of going deeper to see that number on your computer. And when we choose those dives, it may be to explore a certain room in a wreck or get to a certain area in a cave or observe a fish for a certain amount of time and uh, bring equipment that allows us to observe them even better uh, underwater, maybe at a certain depth or beyond the normal amount of time where we can let some of those other divers get away and, and really observe some of the behavior over a longer period. You know, whatever reason that may be, it's important that you and your teammates are all up to speed on that. And then also as a diver or as a technical diver, we have that high focus on the importance of our equipment. We acknowledge this is life support equipment. This is a serious level of diving and we make sure to keep that gear up to date, make sure that it's nice and serviced, it's tested and working before every dive. So we have that reliability factor added to those. And what about training? So we know what technical diving is. We know how it can be a lot of fun and add a lot to our dives. We know that we want to do it and why we're going to do it, but what about when we look at actually getting involved in the training? What is involved here? Is it like an open water course? Is it a little bit more involved? Well, let's take a look. When looking at any training course, especially on the technical level, the first thing that you wanna do is understand the course that you're looking to take and why you may want to take it. So if we're looking at a basic nitrox course, we know, okay, I can add oxygen to, or more oxygen to my cylinder. I can have different levels or a different ratio of oxygen to nitrogen, and I can add benefit to my dives by being able to spend more time at certain depths, extend those no decompression limits. Now, once we understand that that's what we want to do, we want to look at the prerequisites for that program. And the prerequisites are simply the requirements you have to meet before starting a course. And those are there to make sure that you meet a certain level of proficiency in skills and knowledge before you move on to this level of training. And that's there for the protection of you as the diver to make sure that you have what you need to get involved in that training and you aren't going to get in a situation that's too advanced for you or that could compromise your safety in any way. Once we know that we meet the prerequisites, I always have uh, my students or the people that I talk to ask the question, 
am I ready? Just because you meet those prerequisites doesn't necessarily that you're, mean that you're ready to embark on that technical journey. So for example, I was diving for several years with a few hundred dives under my belt before I even took my first technical class because I wanted to make sure that I really had those fundamentals down and was ready to engage in that type of diving. And that was just my own personal requirement and limit. Some are ready much sooner, some are ready later. It's important that you're comfortable with that level of training. Now, once you know that you're ready, a good idea is to speak with an instructor. So call up 4C, ask them about the course that you'd like to take. They can connect you with the instructor that's able to teach that. And then that instructor can talk to you about what's actually involved in that class. What's said in the standards and on paper or the information on the website may be different than what that instructor requires. They may go above and beyond those requirements. Or it may be more involved than you thought it was. When we get to the technical level, it is progressing, perform, sorry, progressive performance-based training. It can often be pretty rigorous. Something like a nitrox course may only take a day to teach or a couple days to work through, whereas something like advanced nitrox and decompression procedures or a rebreather course or an overhead course may take a week to get through. Each course is going to have its own required skills, and as I mentioned, it is progressive training. So you utilize the knowledge and the skills from each course you've taken before to be able to perform and excel in the subsequent courses that you take. So for example, we use the concepts we learned in nitrox diving to build upon in advanced nitrox diving. And then we use those concepts, let's say managing an additional cylinder and using mixtures with elevated amounts of oxygen in conjunction with decompression procedures to be able to perform at those levels and add advantages to those dives as well. So when we're looking through these types of courses, we want to put a lot of effort into making sure we master the skills in these classes before we move on to the next one. Remember, the ocean's going to always be there and we can take our time to get through them. Now, when we're working through the courses, do keep in mind that as we get into technical training, there is more investment from us as a diver on a few different levels. One is from time, time and effort. As we make our way through these courses, there are going to be skills and knowledge that challenge us. And that's a good thing. It's there to make sure that your instructor can make sure that you can perform at these different levels to be as safe as possible when doing this type of advanced diving. Also, the other investment is in training. So we're going to invest in more training and not just learn how to do these skills from YouTube. Acknowledge that that instructor is there to show you the way and to get you into this technical diving world in the safest way possible. And then also in equipment. We have advanced equipment that we use. We have equipment maintenance uh, requirements. We wanna make sure that we take seriously as we get into this training. And also keep in mind that this training is a lot of fun. Though it may be challenging, it is awesome and it exposes you to new skills, to new ways of thinking, and to new environments that you may have never knew existed. And one of my favorite things when we talk about training is also what is your goal? It may be hard to determine what courses that you wanna take next. Well, if we jump back to that goal-based diving, we can come up with what we want to do. If we know there's a certain wreck that we want to see in a depth range, that's going to help us determine the tools that we need to achieve that. If we want to check out the caverns and maybe work our way up to cave, who knows? It's a good place to start and we can find an instructor that can get us to that level and the equipment that gets us in that level as well. Now, here's that flow chart again, just reinforcing that last statement I made. It can help us determine which way we want to go to get to the goal that we have. So choose your path wisely, and remember that you can always choose multiple paths as well. Technical diving prevents us with a, presents us with a lot of opportunities for learning. So there's all different ways we can go with it. And my last topic here that I want to discuss is what can I do to prepare? As somebody who wants to get involved in technical diving, but is still maybe at the very entry level and you're not ready to make that jump yet, some of the things that you can do to try to get to that level are work on your fundamental skills. When we move into technical diving training, we find that basic skill mastery is going to be one of the best things that you can do. 
making sure that you're neutrally buoyant when you can remove that mask and replace it. And you've done it a hundred times, so it's second nature. Because as we move through the technical lineup of courses, you get more and more task loaded. Maybe you're carrying additional cylinders or working in new equipment. Maybe you're trying to stay on a very strict decompression stop schedule while you're also managing a team of buddies and launching a surface marker buoy and making sure you're doing your gas switches. Maybe you're getting involved in a rebreather course where you're you have a lot of task loading, you're monitoring your gas, you're making sure that uh, everything that you, you need is in place and that you're, you're monitoring your, your rebreather unit and that it's doing what you want it to do. So as we get onto those levels, having the mastery of those fundamental skills makes one less thing that we have to worry about. So if our mask has any issues or a regulator comes out of our mouth or whatever it may be, we have a second nature response to, to correct that issue. Now, also, we want to have a high emphasis on buoyancy and body control. So like this picture, this image here, um, just like this diver is doing, focus on being in that nice horizontal trim. Play with your equipment to find that perfect weighting point, whether it's getting new fins that are a little heavier or lighter to help move your body in one way or another, upgrading to a back plate and wing, moving your cylinder, or playing with your weighting. Try to find that perfect weighting point for yourself. Help your buoyancy get down to that as perfect as it can be. And practice your skills neutrally buoyant on every single dive. If we have that mindfulness as we navigate through our sport dives, we'll be very much more prepared as we make that jump to the technical realm. Now, you can also take a look at equipment considerations if you want to get into things like back plates and wings earlier, so you'll be more comfortable in that type of equipment. Your dive planning and diving mentality is something you can work on as well. So plan more and more details. Think about how you're going to manage your gas on your dives. Uh, plan as many aspects of the dive with your buddies as you can. And think about the contingencies. Play the what if game. If you were to run into some sort of issue, how would you and your team members solve it? And do you have the equipment and the experience to do so? And also, keep in mind there is that ladder of proficiency. So when we talked about mastering those fundamental skills, Compounding skills are going to be something we see as we move through the technical ladder. So having those mastered and having a nice self-assessment of how those skills go is going to help you uh, move through those. And one of the other things that you can do is enroll in a course once you're ready. So I recommend starting with the Intro to Tech course. And the reason I say that is because it is a great way to dip your feet into the world of technical diving and see if it's for you. You don't get into any actual decompression dives in that course, but you do play with technical equipment like double cylinders and the various regulators and um, different length hoses and things like that. You get into advanced gas management, how to think, act, and dive like a technical diver without doing the full technical dives. And that lets you know if this seems like something that you want to do. It will also help lower that jump between doing the basic skills of a sport diver and moving into the advanced nitrox and decompression procedures level skills where you're managing two cylinders on your back, one on your side, doing a decompression schedule, launching lift bags. Uh, you're doing all of those things at once. So it helps break down the jumps in between classes, which I'm a huge fan of. So that's a great way to get involved in that. But speak to your local technical instructor. Talk to the people at 4C and they can help you identify what's the next best step for you. So with that, um, that's all that I have to offer at this moment for my presentation, but I have, uh, I'd love to answer some questions from the group and see what questions you guys have and what burning questions you have going on for tech diving. All right. So we do have a few questions. Um, when you were talking about training, uh, obviously with regular courses, um, like, uh, sorry, recreational courses, uh, a medical is required and there's probably a medical required with technical. Do they um, have a, a different type of medical that we need to have signed by a doctor or is it the same one that we would do for the... That's uh, a great question. It's actually the same medical. So you can use that uh, medical that's produced by SDI and TDI. It's made by the UHMS and it just basically makes sure that a diver doesn't have any contraindication towards diving. And if they do have any of those conditions, it just has them get a physician's signature saying they are medically cleared for that type of diving. Now, some instructors may require you to have that medical signed, even if you have all no answers, just to make sure you have that extra level of safety. 
And when moving into the professional levels, the physician signature is required for every single course to make sure you're there. But it is the same medical. Awesome. Okay, so you had some great photos of divers doing. Um, obviously, if you do get into decompression diving, you have longer stops than the regular three minute at 15 feet, right? So what is some of the things that tech divers do for those long safety stops? Um, well, you know, there's all kinds of different things we do. And depending on the dive you're doing, how long you stay and how deep you go, those those decompression stops can really rack up. Sometimes you're spending 20 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that on a stop. It's getting pretty advanced, but it's common on a basic tech dive to have anywhere between 10 and 30 minutes of decompression stops. So some of the things we'll do, uh, I like doing horizontal bubble rings where I'll play with the bubbles and try to make rings that, that hit my buddy. Uh, some people will bring books or tablets or things like that. That's a little more popular in cave diving where you don't have to worry as much about holding that stop. Um, some will just use that as an opportunity to practice their buoyancy or things like valve drills where they shut off um, various components of their setup and practice uh, emergency procedures, things like that. So you know, the best thing you can do is is try to make them as useful as possible. So practice holding those stops, your breath control, your buoyancy, and have a little fun too, because sometimes you're gonna be there for a while. Awesome. Um, so talking about uh, books, I mean, I'm guessing they're not like novels because those are gonna get wet and ruined, but is there any good, um, I mean, obviously there's the training materials that you guys have for technical diving, but is there any good like novels or books that are written that are out there that some of these guys can pick up and if they're peaked, peaking their interest in this kind of diving? Oh yeah, there are tons of them out there. There's lots of supplemental materials that you can pick up to, to add to your diving. Um, I know, for example, Deco for Divers by Mark Powell is a very popular one out there. But based on the, the different discipline of diving you want to get into, I mean, there's all kinds of materials out there. So there's tons of books about wreck diving and cave diving and just deco diving in general, rebreather training. Um, I know Jeff Bozanek has a very popular uh, rebreather training book. So yeah, there's, there, there's everything out there. And you can use a lot of these diver forums or even just going around on Amazon to search for diving and find them. And that leads into another question. Is there groups out there, that, like, you know, dive groups that are like technical dive, you know, groups or clubs that you know of that people can join? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I think for those of us on social media, that presents huge opportunity. All you have to do is go in there and search for your general area and then tech divers or diving club or something like that, and you'll find them, especially here in Florida where we have a ton of access. There's several groups for cave divers. There's several for tech divers just in South Florida or Central or North Florida. So there's tons of opportunity out there. And then you have always have those other groups like Meetup or um, various other services that help connect people. Awesome. Looks like uh, our instructor, Rocky, he says he does Sudoku underwater. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Another person wrote a waterproof case for an iPhone, watch movies and read a book. <laughs> I've seen quite a few people do that. I've always been a little bit scared to put mine in one of those cases and trust it. But some, will pe some people pick up older models and then they'll stack them with things that they can do and they can use that for entertainment underwater. So us tech divers tend to get pretty creative with that kind of stuff. Um, so since we're talking about digital stuff, is there anything um, that tech divers can use and put on themselves for... Because, you know, they are doing longer decompression stops and especially down here with currents, um, ways to be able to be tracked by the boat. Are there devices that you recommend or know of that people are using? Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a couple little like mini marine radios out there that people will use. And that way, if they come up and the boat's gone, they can either connect to the Coast Guard or some service that can help locate them and know where they are. However, I, I don't know of any that would track a diver underwater. However. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things we do, especially around here, is, is shooting those those safety sausages or SMBs to the surface once we start our ascent so the boat has some time to find us and making yeah. sure we have a nice, large, visible one. Definitely. I, I'm waiting to see. Come on, Dima. Someone's got to come out with an like, underwater GPS somehow. It's got it's to be close. Someone's got to have something. But I hope so, you know. 
<laughs> that would be a, that'd be a very cool service to have. I'd feel a lot more confident with that. <laughs> I think a lot of us would, regardless if you're a tech diver or not. But yeah, luckily my boats have always been there to pick me up. But I know some that have, uh, you know, had a couple scary experiences. Um, I know we talked a lot about um, some technical diving here in Florida. We talked about wrecks and and the caves and the caverns and stuff here. Um, what are some other popular um, places outside of the Florida or the U.S. that um, a lot of technical divers can get into um, or, you know, to vacation at or take dives trips to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the U.S., there's, there are caves in several other places. None of them are as popular as North Florida. There's also a lot of opportunities for wrecks, especially when you start to move north. So the northeast part of this country, the whole coastline is very littered with historical shipwrecks. So there's a lot of opportunity and people may have heard the phrase Northeastern Wreck Diver. That's for a reason. There's a lot of wrecks there to explore. Uh, just the last year, I went to Rhode Island and did um, a German U-boat that was sunk at the end of World War II. That was a very historical and very cool dive to do. The Great Lakes have awesome, very well-preserved wooden shipwrecks that are uh, you know, world-class diving sites. And then getting outside of the U.S., I mean, the opportunities are endless. If you go to the Caribbean, there's caves in the Bahamas. There are lots of deep reefs all over the Caribbean. You know, people will go to Grand Cayman and places like that to check out those. Uh, you can get over to places like Micronesia with Truck Lagoon, which is world famous for wreck diving. So the, the possibilities are really endless. You know, as, as tech divers, we're buying a ticket to see more and more parts of this awesome planet and what the underwater world holds. So. Okay. And one more question. You mentioned how much gear you have when you're tech diving. So how do you travel with all this stuff? That is a great question. Um, I personally have a whole room in my house just dedicate, dedicated to equipment itself, and it is full. So when I look at tech diving, I usually look at the type of diving I want to do in the area. I'll see what kind of equipment I can bring. So I'm always going to bring my own regulators, my own computer, uh, my exposure protection that's very custom fit to me, certain things like that that I need to be comfortable and that I also rely on very heavily for my own safety. And then beyond those accessories and the, the essentials that are you know, important for me to pack, I usually see what sort of resources are available in the area. If you have popular tech diving locations, you can maybe rent some of that equipment, like your doubles or maybe even a harness and a, a back plate and wing. In other areas, you're going to have less support for tech diving and you might need to bring several cases of equipment, especially for rebreather divers. It's, it's very common to see them with several boxes or bags that they're bringing to whatever far off location they're going to. So it really depends on what level you're at, what support is available and, and what you're trying to do there. But do make sure that whoever you're working with has you know, uh, a good reputation and the equipment that you need so you're not left without any of that as you're doing those dives. Awesome. Yeah, I know, because a lot of these technical divers are using different types of gases. And so, you know, obviously air and nitrox are um, usually easy to find in some of these places. But how hard is it to find like helium and other types of things that we would need for tech diving? I, you just have to obviously research it before you go. But um, that's, you a, that's a great question. And, and again, that's going to vary by location. Places that are yeah. more set up for technical diving are typically going to have more access to those resources. But there are some areas where things like helium is very scarce. So, mm -hmm. for example, when we looked at that uh, flow chart of courses, you notice extended range and, and trimix are right next to each other. The majority of individuals take trimix because of the availability of helium and the benefits that it adds to their dives. But that extended range course is primarily taken by and exists a lot to fulfill the areas that don't have easy access to helium and have you know uh, dives that are right within that range where they, they have to use air or if they're going to get helium it's going to be prohibitively expensive and i want to also just mention because um you know a lot of people hear the word tech diving and they think oh gosh we got to go to 300 feet and and you said it in your presentation i just want to reiterate it guys you don't have to do deep dives to do technical diving. Um, we can definitely do shallower stuff and use the technical fundamentals um, and the gear. And you'll notice that there's still enjoyment and you don't have to go deep. So if you are like, well, why do I want to go to 300 feet? And that sounds scary. 
no, you can take your stuff and go diving um, and do shallower dives and, and use the skills. I mean, I know you talked about it, but I just want to reiterate to everybody because I don't, I mean, someone like, you know, who's never done tech diving, it's scary to think, oh, you're going to take me down to 300 feet. Ah! Yeah. And, um, sorry, you froze a little bit there. need to reiterate, um, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think that is a great point. Um, and I like that you bring that up. I would say I use my technical diving skills on almost every single dive. And like I mentioned there, it's that confidence and that understanding of the diving that you're doing, but you may have that site that you love to do that's, let's say, 70 or 80 feet in the local area. And maybe you just want to extend the amount of time you spend on it so you can do a full hour at the bottom or a little bit over. You can use these types of skills to be able to do things like that. You can talk to the local dive shop or or captain, see if they'll let you do a longer dive on that same reef, and be able to spend that extra time on it. Or if you're getting close to that no decompression limit, or you might want to exceed it a little bit, if it's okay with the operation you're doing, you can extend some of that time and have the skills to be able to calculate if the gas you have in your cylinders is enough to be able to do that dive and do the limited decompression stops on the way there. I think that everybody should train up to advanced nitrox and decompression procedures level because you learn so much in those courses that applies to every single level of your diving. As dive professionals, it gives us a much deeper understanding of what we're teaching. As divers, it lets you know a lot more about what you're doing diving. And then from there is really where you're taking the steps to get either into much more advanced equipment or those advanced dives where you're doing that 200, 300 feet that that seems pretty intimidating. You have a lot of time and training to work up to those types of depths. Excellent. All right. So, guys, I'm going to go ahead and bring in. This is our website. This is the page for our tech month. So I put it in the comments section, but here it is. Um, As you can see, we have some other Facebook Live stuff that we did last year that we put on this page. If you want to learn more about technical wreck diving, uh, we've got John Chatterton and Alec Hutchinson on that presentation. Um, You can click this link here and learn more about the tech courses available at 4C. Also, your tech charters that are available. And if you're interested in learning about rebreather diving, we had a presentation about that. So you can go on over to this page. And there's also tech ready items. So here's all the stuff that our uh, our shop sells that helps you get the gear to get you diving. So, all right, let's go ahead and get our random name picker. So like I said, guys, if you registered for tonight, we're going to go ahead and give away the uh, TDI intro to tech e-learning digital kit. So we're going to go ahead and hit that Pick a random name and da 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 da. Winner is Eddie, Eddie McCormick. Eddie, if you're listening, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Give us a smiling face emoji. Let us know you're excited. So, this is um, the digital kit, it's not the full course. So, if you want to get the full course, contact one of get you signed up with one of our instructors and if you didn't win tonight but you still want to get into it call us we'll get you started we'll get you this um digital code and you can start learning and then we will uh get you out there and we'll get the training going all right eddie's there he says it's sweet all right good job all right so thank you so much you guys for all the great questions and listening in and jesse thank you so much for a great presentation um we really appreciated all the great content that you had and um we're looking forward to doing more dives in the future yeah thanks for having me thank you everybody for your time and attention congrats eddie all right see you later everybody have a great evening catch you later